which is there was a debate in courting the African American community from uh, within the campaign, I think within the larger Democratic Party about uh, the extent to which paid media in uh, in newspapers, in traditional African American newspapers, the uh, the Defender or the Columbus Communicator you were mentioning before, whether that still has value or if it is inefficient to reach voters that way, and you should spend your more mo- money more on uh, digital and television advertising to try to, or even more appropriately, I guess, radio sure. uh, to try to get uh, black voters uh, energized to the polls and and persuaded, because in some cases this this cycle. Uh, Clinton still had some per- persuasion work to do. Yeah, yeah, and, and John, thanks for having me. You know, look, we had a really good, robust program. We spent a lot of money across a lot of platforms. I'll say this about newspapers: um, it is a, it's a, an evolving um, art form in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, reaching voters. And I would say that definitely some of the newspaper advertising that you see now is digital. Um, it's different as a as a newspaper journalist yourself. I'm sure you know that very well. Um, I think traditional newspaper advertising has changed, um, but I do think in the African American community, it's still very important to be seen and heard in those outlets. Um, I think African American voters expect you to support small um, businesses that are uh, very important and, and very valued in the African American community. And so, I think the campaign did that. I think we um, spent by far across any. Um, constituency group on African American newspapers, we by far um, outspent that. You didn't see us spending print ads on the the Washington Post or on the New York Times or on the Wall Street Journal. You saw us in the Columbus newspaper. You saw us in the Cleveland newspaper. You saw us in the Miami newspaper. So um, I think that was reflected in our campaign strategy. So that's still part of part of what you got to do. I think it's part of what you got to do. I think you th- there's an expectation. I mean, and and. Believe me, um, I'm sure you know very well some of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus who also expect that to be a part of the equation as well, too. And they, right. they made sure we knew that. Yeah, I was about to say, they're, they're, they're not reluctant, they're not reticent. Uh, they are not. To- <laughs> and, and rightfully so. Um, I think it's good that we support those small businesses in the, in the African-American community, and I think that voters appreciate it. Um, all right, so the Democratic Party uh, is, according to so many Democrats right now, lost in the woods, can't figure out where it's going, devastated after this election. I look at it a little differently. I think the Democratic Party got more votes for president than the Republican Party did. I think it got more votes for uh, more votes for uh, le- for the Congress. I, you know, I mean, I look at uh, what happened this time and I'm like, you know, the, the Democrats have to tweak around the edges, not yeah. throw everything that they've been doing out. I'm curious what, what you think the party needs to do. Yeah, I you know, and I think it was easy early on to, you know, before all the vote totals came in to say, uh, we didn't, you know, activate our base, we didn't engage voters the way we needed to. Our numbers are going to be very comparable, very close to Obama 12 numbers. Um, and I think that that is something that we should not back down from. I don't think Donald Trump has the mandate that he's been walking around claiming that he has. Um, I think Democrats have just as strong of a stake to being a part of this agenda and helping to frame this agenda um, as the president-elect does. Um, I will say this, though. You know, it is um, it is very comparable, I think, to 2004 um, when you look at where we are kind of right now. And I'd look at Howard Dean, right? And so think about where the party was at that point. Um, you know, you had the Al Gore loss in 2000, and the party was a little bit lost in the woods and trying to figure out where it was going to go and what the soul of the party was. And if you kind of had some things go differently in some of those early primary states, Howard Dean could have very easily been the standard bearer of the party. I think you could see that in three or four years. I think you could see an Elizabeth Warren. I think you could see, um, you know, folks from the kind of more liberal wing of the party um, kind of take take hold of, of the mantle of the leadership of the party. We've seen proxy wars for the DNC chair okay. already, right? Keith it, Ellison, Tom Perez, Jamie Harrison. You yeah. know, I think that's what that's all about. It's uh, So who are they the proxies for? Can you interpret that for me a little bit? Oh, man. Uh, I think I'd be making a lot more money if I could interpret <laughs> it for you. Um, I, I mean, think Perez seems to be the Obama proxy. It, I think that's right. I think that's right. I think if you kind of think about where the party is, the establishment, and, and, and I know it's kind of become an ugly word, but I mean that with um, all due respect, uh, the establishment of the party is probably more the Tom Perez. Um, I think Jamie Harrison's a really interesting candidate, and I think he's got interesting support, particularly um, from kind of the state party chairs, the kind of rank and file membership of the party. And then obviously Keith Ellison, um, who has been a superstar with the Progressive Caucus and the Progressives in the party for a long time. I have no doubt that Keith Ellison has been on these airwaves many times. Uh, Peter's not listening to me right now, but (laughs) I assume Keith Ellison is a friend in good standing of this show. 
because uh, how could he not be, right? Right, Peter? Yeah. Keith Ellison? Keith Ellison, we've had on the show many, many times uh, over the years. I'll say this about Keith Ellison. As long as we've had him on the show, uh, which, again, goes back to as soon as he was sworn in, um, he has been talking about and will go out of his way to say, we have a real problem down ballot. We have a real problem when you look at state legislatures, state by state by state. Democrats have a superstar in their president. And a lot of the state legislators are getting left in the dust, and we've got to fix that. He's been saying that for years. So, so actually, and Peter, I think that's an interesting point. You know, I think President Obama, um, it's a really interesting legacy that we're starting to kind of carve out for the president. I think that of party builder is one that there's a lot left to be written. I think a lot of people were concerned that it became the party of Obama. It wasn't the Democratic Party or the Progressive Party. It was the party of Obama. I think if you look at the Obama coattail effect, um, there isn't one when he's not on the ballot. And right. I think that's got to be concerning. And I think the party has to look at, okay, um, now that we are in the post-Obama era, how are we going to either keep that co- uh, rather that coalition or how are we going to change that coalition going forward? Um, I think that's a really interesting part of this discussion about you know, the soul of the party. Yeah, I mean, there's this whole this whole line of thinking right now that, uh, that Secretary Clinton should have uh, sort of started with her old base the the working white class working white class the white working class right uh, and and tried to then sweep in the Obama coalition uh, over time um, you know I'm not sure I, I think you make a great point that President Obama went out there and campaigned hard he said I'm on the ballot this time as he had in 2014 yeah and it did not produce the same kind of numbers sure. and we're all talking about margins here right like so you look at Philadelphia you look at Southeast Pennsylvania and Hillary Clinton walks out of there with 450 thousand with a 450,000 vote lead, that ought to be enough to win Pennsylvania. Yeah. In yeah. any normal year, it is. Absolutely. So, you know, from the, the perspective of, like, did uh, did the Obama coalition turn out? Like, no, not the exact same Obama coalition, but but a little bit added here, and a little they bit were subtracted never, They there. were never going to turn out for – they're not. Barack Obama's coalition is not going to turn out for Hillary Clinton. That's a – and, and by the way, I don't think the campaign expected that. I don't think that right. was our – that was not our win strategy was to get the exact same coalition. It was to get a good chunk of that coalition and then to also make some Republicans who were un, un, uh, uncomfortable with Donald Trump as their standard bearer to either stay home or to come and, and, and support Hillary Clinton. Um, and, and I think that that was working. I think it's been a lot of, obviously, conversation about the Comey letter and some of the things that happened in the last month. I think that gave a permission slip to some Republicans who were thinking about doing that. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what happened there. All right, so back to these candidates. You were mentioning Jamie Harrison before. Jamie is the chairman of the South Carolina Democratic Party, Yeah, uh, a former aide to Jim Clyburn. He's got, like, one of the best personal stories uh, you could, I think, imagine in terms of, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, when he was a kid, uh, there was an, an insurance issue with his house, like living with his grandmother or whatever. And he basically was like, I want to, like, buy my grandmother a house. Like, that was, like, yeah. a like a, yeah. a big thing in his mind. He uh, he went to Yale, went to Yale Law School, uh, worked for Jim Clyburn in the house, was his floor director, and then went home to South Carolina to help build the party there. Yeah. Um, and I think he's kind of – he's got a great narrative. He's a great guy. I, I personally like him a lot. Um, what You said he was – he's making some progress with some of the party officials – is that, I mean, obviously those are the, the voters in this thing. Right. Is it possible that somebody with a small name, so to speak, ends up winning this? Yeah, I think kind of the way I, I just think about it is he may be the person who kind of represents that that constituency, right? If you've got one that represents like the leadership, the establishment, you know, Tom Perez, you've got one that represents the kind of progressive wing of the party that's become uh, more engaged and, and becomes the kind of heartbeat of the party uh, when we hit our, hit our primaries. And then I think Jamie is kind of the person who is being positioned as maybe the favorite of the kind of hardcore rank and file people who do the nitty gritty work, who work on the platform committee, who do things like that, who understand the ins and outs of how do you build a party 365 days a year? That's how I view it. Um, I am no expert on these things, but that's definitely how I view it. What, what went right for you guys this time on the Clinton campaign? You're saying what went right for uh-huh. us? You know, 
I mean, I think the fact that you almost get a three million vote, uh, you know, win over over Donald Trump, I think a lot has to go right. I, I'd say um, I think we define Donald Trump um, maybe a little too well. Um, but I think what do you we, mean by that? Can you break that down? Yeah, I mean, I think we define Donald Trump as a risky choice, and I think people understood that. I think something that just being self-critical we could have done is we could have made that pivot a little bit sooner to and here's why you should vote for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there was certainly a lot of reliance on people are going to be concerned about Donald Trump. People are going to view him as a irrational choice for president, and so they are not going to make that decision. I think we did a good job with that. Um, but I think looking back, and you know, you're always looking back and you're trying to figure out, eh, what do we, what can we do differently? I think that's probably the thing we could do differently is maybe make that pivot to making the positive case for Hillary Clinton. We had positive ads up for Hillary Clinton, but obviously people focused more on the ad with the kids watching TV or some of the, yes. which, which I think was really smart because I don't think you saw Hillary Clinton bashing Donald Trump in any of those ads. It was all his words. We put those words right back out in front of the public. Did you, do you think that there was a saturation point where, where people stop, like people become sort of inured to Donald Trump saying awful things? Yeah, I mean, that happens. And, you know, there's been all the discussion about the free media and whatnot. And I think that normalizes it. Um, we tried our best not to allow it to normalize. But I think it does when you see him on, you know, Morning Joe talking to, you know, Scarborough Mika. Um, when you see him on CNN and you see people just saying, OK, Donald Trump says something else outrageous today. It almost becomes a reality show. And I think people can get lost in that. And yeah. so. I think there's a little bit of that that happened. And also, look, as much as the narrative is what went wrong for Hillary, again, you've got a almost a three million vote cushion in the popular vote. <laughs> uh, not, by the way, that doesn't mean that Donald Trump did not win the Electoral right. College. But that is kind of an interesting thing to navigate, right? It's to say, how do you, how do you say, oh, we didn't do our job when in reality you think for the most part, you did your job with the exception of about two or three states that, you know, we could have done better in. So uh, it'll be an interesting leg. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people like you who are going to spend a lot of years rewriting, you know, what happened. I'm working on that right now. Um, please buy the book when it comes out. You uh, should. That's right. I will.